Welcome to this week's edition of Good Books Radio. I'm Dr. W.F. Strong, your host. I want to thank our underwriter, audiobooks.com, where your first book is free. They have 40,000 titles available. That's a lot of listening, so you better get started. Today we're talking dogs, man's best and oldest friend. Our guest today is Dr. Alexandra Horowitz, who has written a New York Times bestseller called Inside of a Dog. So you want to know what your dog is thinking of you. You want to know how your dog experiences the world, why he smells fire hydrants, what he thinks of you. Does he love you? Do they laugh? Do they play in the way that we do? These are some of the things we're going to discuss today. Dr. Horowitz, thank you for joining us. How are you today? I'm well. Thanks for having me. Yes, absolutely. I want to begin with my first big question, uh, something I've always wondered. Dogs have about 12 times our sense of smell, right? Actually, I'd estimate it's exponentially greater sense of smell, um, although exactly the number hasn't been calculated. We do know they have hundreds of millions more receptors in their nose than we do, and so that probably pans out to being... um, considerably um, more able to detect any smell in the environment. So if they have this greater sense of smell, why are they smelling pee? Because pee has a lot of information in it that we really aren't attuned to Mm -hmm. for two reasons. One, we don't get that close, you know, (laughs) and help it. And and two, our noses um, can't detect some of the information that's in it. Uh, I, I also think dogs really aren't judging smells the way we do. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't open our eyes and say, "Oh, well, this that shade of blue is horrible, and this picture is very good." And we don't just say things are good or bad. That's what we say about smells. Mm-hmm. But for dogs, I think smells are just like mm, sight is for us information. So we are more sight oriented, and they're more smell oriented. Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And what do they learn from smelling a fire hydrant? What do they get? What's the information? Well, at some level, I can only speculate, given the type of information that we know is in something like urine. But it would be along the lines of this, the information about who's been by before, you Mm -hmm. know, the identity of that dog, uh, maybe how long ago they've been by, um, their health. Mm -hmm maybe their gender, Mm -hmm. their sexual readiness, um, maybe what they've eaten recently, uh, maybe their stress level. All those things are are information in in urine. And so the dog's interested in that. Just like when we meet somebody, Mm -hmm. we take an assessment of them and we have visual clues to um, many of those things. Well, we spend our time, I I think, uh, trying to reach dogs, trying to have them understand us, and we we focus a lot on the the sight dimension. Would you argue that uh, we're we're not tapping into the best way of reaching them? Yeah, I think that we have a lot of misunderstandings about dogs based on just projections from ourselves to Mm -hmm. dogs, and that includes, um, but it's not limited to, the fact that we assume they see the world and experience the world like we do. Mm -hmm. Um, And as you said, you know, we're seeing creatures and they're smelling creatures. So that, to begin with, marks an enormous difference between our perceptions of the world. I think in my own experience with dogs, like most people, I've had many in, in my life and have been very close to them. And one of my greatest heartbreaks in life was, uh, you know, losing a dog that was very close to me and smartest dog I ever had. And uh, I spent most of my time uh, teaching her, training her, but uh, in, a, in a visual way. And yet I sensed often that her connection to me was uh, based on smell, but I didn't know how to tap into it, you know, to, to make a stronger bond that way. Is there, do you have any suggestions as to how a person might use smell to better connect with their dogs? I agree that it's a puzzle since we don't think about things in terms of smells. Um, I think that a lot of the bond, as you say, between the, a person and the dog has to do with um, this mutual affection, but also um, 
reliability of each other. And one of the things we could be more or less reliable about, I suppose, um, is smell. So, for instance, if, you know, some days you wear a cologne, what you're doing is kind of masking your actual odor. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's a bad thing to just smell the way one is um, reliably, and the dog will be able to identify you more quickly and readily. You know, I have a, a an experience I want to tell you about where I was living in Arizona at one point, and I had to leave and move to another state, and I couldn't take my dog that I'd had for a couple of years, so I gave her away to a neighbor. And about a year and a half later, I came back, and I stopped by to visit, and of course the dog was there. And what shocked me was she didn't seem to recognize me by, by voice, but once she could smell me, she went crazy. I mean, she was just jumping yeah. all over me, and it made me feel really bad, you know, for ever, <laughs> ever abandoning her that way. I had to, but yet it still made me feel really bad, and her connection to me was clearly through smell. Yeah, I think it's right. I mean, they certainly have decent vision, mm -hmm. but I think that they'll, there are all sorts of great videos now online, for instance, of soldiers returning. Oh, yeah, um, I've from, seen those. And often, the first glimpse that the dog gets of the individual is not one where the dog is recognizing the mm -hmm. individual, but then when they get closer and can smell them, um, they go into that really merry, happy dance that they do when um, when they're seeing somebody that they've missed. So, yeah, I, I, and um, and they have, you know, plenty good memory. They can remember for for quite a long time. Well, let's talk about your approach in this book. Um, you know, your let's talk about your background first. How did you get into studying dogs in this way? Pretty much accidentally. I was uh, somebody who lived with dogs, but in graduate school, I was studying more typical um, non-human animals. Dogs weren't really widely studied in cognitive sciences, which is what I was doing, but. I wound up being interested in looking at play behavior in, an, in animals, and when looking for a subject which played a lot, so I could see, you know, what were the behaviors they did in play, and what could we infer about what they know based on how they play. And of course, you know, I, I had a playing creature in my own home that I was taking out three times a day <laughs> to play in the in, on the beach I lived in California at the time, or in a park. And so I, um, you know, made the case with my dissertation advisors that I should be studying dogs, and they reluctantly but happily agreed. And then I just got interested in, instead of the, the kind of theoretical topic, I got interested in dogs. I, I like the dogs, point that you, you know? make. I like the point that you make early in the, in your book about how we as humans. Uh, confuse our understanding of dogs with uh, metaphor and projection, that we project on them human characteristics, which they probably ultimately don't have, or at least not in the form we like to project upon them. Yeah, these anthropomorphisms, basically, where we're sort of assuming that they're just like us, only smaller and furrier and probably less smart, um, don't do them any service. And it's not mm -hmm. uncommon to project onto your dog. I mean, I think that's, in fact... The human species has probably been doing that for a time immemorial. But I think it's interesting to maybe test some of those projections and say, hey, you know, what can science tell us about whether I'm actually right in thinking that my dog is guilty when he, you know, gives me that look <laughs> before I make any decisions like punishing him if he is, you know, if he does understand when he's done something wrong. So mm -hmm. I, I, I do it too, you know, as a person who lives with dogs, I still think my dog looks proud when he has a really big stick in his mouth. <laughs> but I also realize, as an observer of animal behavior, that he also just has to hold his head up really high to balance the weight of the stick. And he may be proud, he may be not, but I shouldn't necessarily assume it. Well, we certainly do treat them like members of the family. I saw some stat that said to us that what, half of dog owners buy Christmas presents for their dogs. Wow. Yeah, they, I mean, and I think they've, they do benefit from that, obviously. Sure. Uh, most, most owners do consider them members of the family, 
many more than a generation or two ago. And it's to the species' advantage that they've insinuated themselves into our homes like this, you know. And so I think if we're so interested in them, you know, better the better than buying them a Christmas present might be just trying to understand how they see the world and what's important to them. Well, as as one who has studied uh, dogs in an unusual way, trying to quite quite metaphorically get into their heads. Mm-hmm. What do you see people doing with their dogs that troubles you? I'm not talking about people who are being abusive. I'm talking about people who mean well, but they're just not getting it. Right. Well, there's there are a lot of types of things which people do just because they maybe had a preconception mm-hmm. about what it's like to be with a dog. So, um, you know, simple things like when people adopt a dog, they assume that the dog immediately... Um, sort of knows the rules of the house if they're told the rules of the house. And then they might punish them or, you know, be disappointed if the dog isn't immediately obeying or if the dog doesn't learn the few training things that they've been told they should do upon adopting a dog. You know, you can really have an enormously valuable relationship with a dog without training them to shake a paw, you know. <laughs> it's, it's odd, and, and uh, but for some reason that's the way we've treated dogs. Or even taking your dog on a walk, mm-hmm. and live in a city, and so we take dogs on a lot of walks, and I see a lot of people who take dogs on um, a walk and are just yanking them along and hurrying them along, and I think it's appropriate at some point that, you know, if you have to take your dog out to relieve him, himself or herself, yeah, you might just be making a quick walk. But Actually, you know, some of the times that the dog goes out, they probably just want to sit there and smell things Mm -hmm. because that's their world. So I always recommend that maybe one walk a day be a smell walk where they just stop and let the dog smell whatever they want to smell and move on when the dog is ready. And I think that will be a rewarding experience for the dog. It takes a little patience, but then it became rewarding to me too when I started seeing how much fun that was for him instead of just yanking him off you know to get around the block quickly and you you did a lot of your study at the park right yeah well i'm with almost all ethology or animal behavior you try to study your animal in its natural environment Mm -hmm. and for dogs that's just you know around people and other dogs there's no you know, there's no wild dog. I mean, there is a species called wild dogs, but there's no wild domestic dog that you can go and study. It's, you know, how do dogs behave when they're in owners' homes, and how do they behave when they're interacting in, in the park with other dogs? So that's where I study them. Do dogs talk? Sure, they talk with their. I mean, they have vocalizations. You know, besides barks, which there are various. You know, they make lots of other sounds, but I think mostly they talk with their body. They have, you know, they use their hackles, their ears, their muzzle, their mouth. Um, They use their tail, certainly. They use their whole body posture. All of those things are communications to each other. And then they communicate to each other through the information that they they leave, um, you know, in their urine, for instance. Mm -hmm. So that's not as much of a direct conversation, but they choose when to do that. So um, that's a kind of intentional communication. Like, uh, it's interesting that, um, you know, a lot of dogs, they pee in the same place. They they go by, one they smell, the and then they pee. And uh, is that a one-upsmanship, or is that just a, you know, leaving right. a, a message in doggy Facebook, just a response? Right. Mm-hmm. It, you know, people talk about pee mail. I think that's not too far off. It's, you know, it's a good place. If they've smelled someone else's information on that, Lamp post or something, mm-hmm. then it's probably a good place to leave their information too, like a bulletin <laughs> board. I think of it that way, and it doesn't have mm-hmm. to do with covering someone else's urine, although it might do that. You know, you'll mm-hmm. notice they're usually not very direct, you know, mm-hmm. yes. <laughs> they're very specific. <laughs> it's more that That's somewhere true. on that bulletin board is a good place to leave a message. <laughs> That's funny. So, the well, what's the difference in wolves and, and dogs? Well, there are lots of types of difference. Um, I mean, one is because wolves aren't domesticated, they're not, you know, good house pets. Uh, They're much more, they're much less interested in humans. They view humans 
as um, something to be wary of. Whereas dogs will look people directly in the eyes. You know, they make eye contact with us, and I think that's part of our feeling that we have an understanding together. They look at us like other people do. But if a wolf looks you in the eyes and you look back at them, you know, you're exchanging a threat Mm -hmm. with each other. And uh, you better not do that. I'd actually really recommend you never do that with a wolf. (laughs) But with a dog, unless you're a stranger and you're giving a hard stare, often that's part of feeling like... You know, you're conversing with each other. Mm-hmm. So that's a, a major difference right off the bat. You know, dogs consider humans part of their social world, and wolves do not. Well, you make a point in the book that dogs are much more uh, expressive via their greater range of barks than a wolf is. Dogs have a better wolves vocabulary. Wolves don't have. <laughs> that's true. Barks seem to evolve, basically, with dogs, um, and it's there are a lot of theories about why they would be using barks, especially since humans don't find them that appealing, you know. Mm-hmm. But they are vocal and we're vocal, so maybe it's a kind of partially um, an imitation of us. Oh. But there's certainly a lot mm-hmm. of olfactory communication um, and body communication in both dogs and wolves. I used to have a shepherd, and uh, the shepherd used to kind of drive me crazy once in a while because she would um, be in the back seat of the car and she would do this this high-pitched little yelp right in my ear. Hmm. And, uh, <laughs> I don't know what that was about, but it, was, it wasn't a real bark. It wasn't a warning. It was just a you know, high-pitched thing. And, uh, yeah, I don't know, but it, what's interesting about the dog's use of these barks or yelps or even whines is that um, when, they, when they seem to not be getting their message across to us, you know, we don't do whatever they're asking or we're mm-hmm. not responsive to whatever they're expressing, they just keep doing it, you know, and um, <laughs> we never seem to get it. <laughs> so it's not that effective with humans. Well, I, you know, sometimes when I'm uh, just trying to understand what dogs want, or any species for that matter, particularly dogs, I think of that uh, famous uh, scene in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy where he explains that porpoises or dolphins have been here on Earth a long time, and they were put here to communicate with us, but we're too stupid to understand <laughs> what they're telling us. <laughs> so that somebody, might be the case with lots of animals. I think yeah, he was on something. We're just not bright enough to to get, uh, you know, the complex communication that they're that they're using to reach us. The what, the, the wisdom in that is really actually um, that we assume that to be smart. Mm-hmm. You know, you have to be a human. And obviously there are lots of different ways to be smart. Lots of different intelligence. Mm-hmm. Is there a breed of dog that's uh, significantly smarter than other breeds? At least by our standards? The whole question, is, I think, to, is a fraught one because the question of intelligence of breeds, you know, it's really what the what you want the breed to do. Uh-huh. So dogs like Border Collies are usually rated as pretty intelligent because mm-hmm. they're very good worker dogs, yeah. and they um, they need a lot of activity, and they need a project. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you wanted um, just an easygoing companion dog, and you, you, know, and you want a dog to fit that bill, the mm-hmm. Border Collie would be a horrible dog. It's not smart at being an easygoing companion dog. Um, so it kind of depends on how you define, you know, what's smart. Uh, Labradors are not often considered the smartest dog, but they're amazingly good companions. So I, and I also think a lot of these dogs who are not, um, likely to solve problems on their own, which is often a part of an intelligence test, Mm -hmm. have sort of solved problems like, gee, that food is out of reach and I can't get to it Mm -hmm. by implicating us, you know, they'll look to us and say, hmm, <laughs> you can solve that problem, and guess what, we do. So I would consider that in some ways that's smartest, the dogs who would say, oh, they're the dumbest, they're really the smartest. So the question becomes kind of moot in my mind. So can I manipulate my human to do this for me? <laughs> I mean, that's pretty deception and manipulation, mm-hmm. being kind of Machiavellian, that might be the smartest thing of all. Very good point. That's what people say about cats, that cats are too smart to be trained. <laughs> yeah, to be bothered with the rest <laughs> of the stuff, but they get food out of us nonetheless. Uh, well, I've heard of a, a intelligence test for dogs. You put a towel over their head and see how long it takes them to get, off, get it off of them. Have you heard that? <laughs> no, no, and I probably wouldn't do that to my dog. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, I've tried it on several, and it doesn't really take you know three or four seconds, and, <laughs> and they can get it off. They just take their paws, and you know. But evidently, some um, can't figure it out. They can't figure out how to get it off. So, I, and I've spent a life around working dogs because I mm. grew up on uh, working on a farm, and it was around you know working animals. And you're right; if uh, a lot of animals, like German shepherds, they kind of need something to do. They need a project. They need a purpose. Or they just start tearing up stuff. <laughs> right. And then that's sort of suddenly described as misbehavior. It's not mm-hmm. really. It's, I don't, they don't have anything to do. The, you ran a lot of experiments in your book. Uh, what what uh, are a couple of your most revealing experiments in terms of teaching us important things? Well, I, um, a lot of the experiments I read about are not my own. You know, if they're from other researchers who mm-hmm. do dog cognition studies. One of mine, which, is, which I like a lot... Um, because it gets to that idea you brought up earlier about the projections we make onto dogs, mm-hmm. was of the guilty look that dogs have and whether it you know, showed up more often when a dog was actually guilty of disobeying a command, which was um, to not eat some tasty food in front of them when, when the owner left the room, or if it showed up more often under some other condition. And it was a pretty simple experiment. You know that guilty look where they put their ears oh, yes. back and they kind of cower or mm-hmm. maybe even walk away and... Um, and I think it matters because we wonder if a dog is having a feeling of guilt. We feel you know, we feel worse if we think they're somehow violating the house rules, you know, intentionally. And we feel better if we know they feel sorry for it. So it turned out that they didn't show this look more often when they'd done something wrong. Mm-hmm. They showed the look most often when they were about to be punished or were punished, whether the owners, you know were right or wrong about assuming they had um, eaten the treat. So even when owners incorrectly punish them, you mm-hmm. know, I said, oh, yeah, the dog ate the treat, but the dog had not. Uh-huh. The dog still showed all this guilty look. And so it seems to me it's more described as a submissive behavior or a, a show they put on to say, you know, please don't punish me. I see you're about to punish me. Please don't. <laughs> um, and... I think it's important that we know, that we say, we don't know if they feel guilty, but this look isn't indicating that they do. So that's a perfect example of how we project human feelings onto them that they may not actually have. Yeah, we assume they have all the emotions mm-hmm. that we have, um, but guilt is a complex one, or jealousy, or or pride, and it, it's worth questioning whether they really do. I always like the way we we uh, make dog food in the shape of little bones and stuff like uh, like they see that that way. Right, right. I mean, that is, of course, a field entirely <laughs> directed towards owner satisfaction. Yeah. What about bedding? You know, we try to make beds that I think we would like, but do we? are we actually right. making beds they would like? I think the dog wants to be in a safe place and next to you. Mm-hmm. You know, and if one of the two of those things can be satisfied, they're happy with an enormous range of things, you know. Mm-hmm. You can buy yourself, your dog, an expensive dog bed if you'd like, but I don't think that the dog feels like he's getting an extra special treat. You feel like you're treating your dog <laughs> in an extra special way. But it's just like, uh, I suppose, the the um, not only the, the, you know, we get them expensive toys, but uh, sometimes, you know, nothing can beat a tennis ball. Sure. Right? Right? <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. or, the, or the old shoe that I... Mm-hmm. Uh, the old shoe they like to chew up or something. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I, and and I don't think that there's anything wrong with an expensive toy if it's engaging mm-hmm. and so forth. Um, but mm, I, I think there are more in, more interesting ways to indulge the dog. What about frisbees? Do you do you think that uh, you know dogs? A lot of dogs I've had they just love chasing a frisbee, and then I've had people tell me. Oh, uh, that's not good for them. You know, they uh, you're you're wearing them out because they'll never stop until you stop, and or it's bad for well, their teeth. Or there are know, some dogs who will go until they're exhausted. That's mm-hmm. true, but uh, you know, on a whole, it's it's an engaging. You know, the dogs are are evolved from um, some relation of the wolf. Mm-hmm. Um, wolves and dogs share a common ancestor. These are animals who would have hunted for prey that's fleeing. Maybe it's a bird. Maybe it's Mm-hmm. ground animal. They like chasing things. I mean, yeah, not all do. of them. Dogs, as it turns out, dogs who uh, have shorter noses, you know, like like a pug, for instance. Uh-huh. They have eyes. Um, they have cells in their eyes, which make it more likely that they can focus on something right in front of them, 
and less likely they can focus on like the rabbit or the frisbee, you know, tearing across the horizon. And I so didn't know that. they That's probably aren't as interested in frisbees at all. You mm-hmm. know, you try to throw a, a frisbee for a pug, and you're not going to get a lot of pugs who who love that and will keep doing it. They they're more interested in maybe sitting in your lap, staring at your face. One last question, and you may not this may not be in your field of expertise, but I'm sure you've run across it because it's been around a while. The idea that dogs can smell cancer on somebody. Oh, they certainly can. Um, I mean, they have to be trained to tell us that they have found it. Uh But, um, yeah, there are good studies now showing that they can detect bladder cancers and urine and lung cancer and breast and melanomas and so forth um, because, you know, cancer cells have a distinctive smell, and Mm -hmm. so it's distinguishable from the rest of the smell of your own body. But... A dog has to be trained to pick that out and then tell you that it has that it has found the smell. You know, your own dog might smell it, but they don't know that's important to us. Mm. You know, they don't know it's cancer. They just know that they they just know it smells different. So is anybody um, using this? The very first case. Sorry. Is is anybody using this somewhere? I mean, does a hospital yeah. actually use a dog? Well, they're working on they're working on projects. To do just that, you know, right now it's not the most efficient way of Mm -hmm. getting information about um, cancer patients, but there's a lot of research in that direction, and dogs can perform at high, Mm -hmm. high levels. You said the very first case was what? The very first case was anecdotal. A woman noticed that her dog was really interested in a spot on her body and had it checked out, and um, it turned out to be a melanoma. And that got people interested in whether, you know, if dogs were trained on these smells, they could identify them readily and do a specific behavior so you'd know that they found the cancer cells. And they happen. Wow. That's that's mind-blowing. Well, Dr. Horowitz, I, I know you have a busy week uh, grading, <laughs> but I really thank sure you enough. for for joining us. This is the best dog book I've read in years, and it. Uh, oh, that's and, very nice. Well, thank it's you. particularly wonderful because it opens up the world of dogs through the eyes of dogs, rather than through, as you say, the anthropomorphism of us pre- projected onto uh, dogs. So, thanks again uh, for joining us. The book is Inside of a Dog by Dr. Alexandra Horowitz, New York Times bestseller. I'm W.F. Strong for Good Books Radio. Have a great day.